two, I think. Hi, ladies and uh, gentlemen. If I could get your attention, and uh, we'll introduce the next session, titled um, "Access and Respect: Legal and Ethical Considerations." I'd like to introduce Elliot Bledsoe. Elliot um, will be chairing the session. Most recently, um, Elliot has worked for Creative Commons in Brisbane uh, before he moved to Sydney last year to become Digital Content Officer at the Australia Council for the Arts. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Elliot. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I've only just got here, but uh, I'm here to introduce the session on legal and ethical considerations for the digitization of your collection. So we've got uh, three esteemed speakers who are going to talk for 10 to 15 minutes each on this amazing topic about how you go from wanting to open up your collection to talking to your legal team. Um, that's, uh, that's always an interesting, rewarding and challenging experience. Um, people with legal expertise are awesome people. I don't just say that because I have it. Um, but it's, uh, it's a really important part of the process, of course, that, um, you know, the whole idea of this ethical considerations of access, that's a very, very important part, not just from the sort of cultural and practical access to collections, but that, you know, your legal team have an important part to, you know, important role to play in that process in helping you make sure that the access that you're providing to your collection is responsive and appropriate to your collection and to the kinds of uses that people want to make of it and the kinds of obligations that your institutions have around their collections. Um, so today we've got three speakers, as I said. The first one is Robin Ayres. Uh, she's the Executive Director of Arts Law, a national community legal centre for the arts. Uh, she will give a brief and general outline of how copyright legislation affects the digitisation of heritage materials and artworks. If you'd like to welcome Robin Ayres. everyone. I'm just going to get my presentation up there. It's really a bit of a, um, a copyright 101 session. Um, so if anybody has done any copyright law or any detail, um, this might be a, a little bit of a refresher for you. 
Um, but I, I noticed that there is quite a diverse range of um, people um, and backgrounds in the <coughs> this conference or the seminar workshop um, session, so um, I'm hoping this will be useful to some of you. Um, I th first thought it might be good for people to at least know about the Arts Force Centre of Australia. Um, I have got a pile of pamphlets down the front that um, there should be enough for everyone to take away if you haven't heard of arts law before. Um, as Elliot mentioned, we are the National Community Legal Centre for the Arts and we give free uh, legal advice to artists and arts organisations if they're subscribers to arts law. So we have um, lawyers on the telephone um, who talk to artists and arts organisations about the legal issues affecting them. Um, we also have a document review service, so if you've got documents that need to be reviewed, for example, a licensing agreement, we will give best practice advice to arts organisations about your documents. We also provide referrals to lawyers and accountants. We have a whole range of publications, including sample agreements that are available on our website, lots and lots of information sheets and articles uh, about a whole range of legal issues affecting the arts, um, not just copyright, uh, it's quite broad. Um, we give workshops and we um, do a lot of advocacy around law reform issues. So we've been very active around protecting Indigenous intellectual property and last year around the whole censorship and classification <coughs> issues. And we work cl quite closely with the um, uh, uh, National Gallery of Australia, um, Australian um, Centre for the Moving Image around some of those issues. We have um, an Indigenous service called Artists in the Black, so we're very active in giving advice to um, artists, um, Indigenous artists and Indigenous art uh, organisations. And Solid Arts could be really useful for you to know about. It's about protecting and respecting Indigenous intellectual property and there's a whole lot of resources on that website around these issues. So I'm going to quickly run through what's copyright, what does it protect, who owns it, what rights do copyright owners have, how long does it last, what are some of the exceptions and getting permission and touch upon moral rights. Because all of these issues are relevant to digitising collections because what we're looking at is actually making digital reproductions often or digital copies of the material that's protected by copyright. So you need to understand the basic rules because the basic rules apply in the digital context. Uh, so first of all, what's copyright? Well, a copyright law in Australia is set out in our Copyright Act. So everything I'm talking about today is really found in the Copyright Act and some of the decisions that courts have made in relation to that act. And what this act tries to do is balance the rights of the creators, the people who create the copyright protected material, with the rights of um, society to benefit from those creative endeavours. So it's a real balancing act. And some people would say the balance isn't right at the moment. But what I'm telling you today is just what the act says and what the rights of creators are vis-a-vis um, -vis some of the exceptions that might apply. So basically copyright is about some exclusive rights that are given to um, the copyright owners, so it may be the creators or it might be belong to somebody else. Um, and, and the rights, I'll go through the rights in more detail, but you know, the rights are around copying and reproduction of material that's protected. They're exclusive rights that belong to the copyright owners and they're a bundle of rights. So they're rights that can actually be um, siphoned off or you can give away part of it or you can license part of the rights and keep hold of other, other parts of the right. They're economic rights, so the, the Act actually gives the creators the right to make money from their copyright. So it's an important right for, Arts Law is an artist organisation, we mainly represent artists, um, about 75% of our clients are artists, so we're looking at this from a potential income stream for artists. And copyright is different to the rights um, in the physical object. So if you own the painting, if you have the painting in your collection, it doesn't necessarily mean that you've got the copyright unless you've actually um, got an assignment of copyright um, or um, a, an exclusive licence to use the copyright. So what does copyright protect? This is just a bit of a pictorial... Um, uh, pictorial image of, of the various things that are protected under the Copyright Act. 
So it protects literary works, things like books, lyrics of songs, um, articles, artistic works, paintings, sculptures, photos, uh, musical works, so that's the, the musical tune, uh, dramatic works, plays, choreography, films, sound recordings, broadcasts and public editions. So you can see a lot of those would be in collections that are going to be digitised. So, so it could be um, uh, a sound recording that's on an old record, um, for example, or a film that is on a, um old uh, video, or it could be a, um, a tape of a, of a musical recording, of a, a tape of a, of a piece of music. Uh, this is just, you, you have to satisfy all of these requirements to get copyright in Australia. So your subject matter needs to fall within one of those categories I just set out in the previous slide. It must be recorded in material form. So a, a spontaneous work um, that hasn't been recorded, it hadn't been written down or it hasn't been filmed or taped in some way, that won't get copyright protection. That's an issue for a lot of um, some of uh, Australia's indigenous cultural heritage because it hasn't been recorded in material form, so it won't get copyright protection. It has to be original, but that's not a very high originality test. Basically, it just means not copied. Um, and there has to be a connection with Australia. So the country connection could be a resident um, that created the work or a citizen of Australia, or the work's been created by a country where Australia's got reciprocal um, agreements because of international treaties that are in place. So we will protect the works of people from other countries in Australia because we're all signed up to the same international treaties. Who owns copyright? Well, the, the first sort of the general rule, I'm sorry, and this is really embarrassing because Donna's going to go after me from the Art Gallery of New South Wales and she's got all these fantastic images. And, um, but this is just putting it, this is sort of the, the boring lawyer um, presentation. This is about as exciting as we get. And then you get to see how you can actually use it in practice. So my apologies to clip art. Um, so who owns copyright? Uh, so generally, it's the um, first principle is that it's the the author or the creator of the work. So it's generally speaking, it's the artist who paints the picture, or the writer who writes the the novel, or the article, or the um, the sculpture who makes the sculpt um, the sculptor who makes the sculpture, or the filmmaker. Oh, slightly different makers. Um, so with certain works, it's the makers who own the copyright. So films and sound recordings, it's the, it's the makers, the people who put up the money to make the film. So with films, the producers. With sound recordings, um, more and more these days, it's actually there are independents who are making their own sound recordings, but previously it used to be the record labels who would be the owners of the sound recordings. There are some very, very important exceptions to these basic principles. First one is employment. So if you create something um, as, as part of your employment, so if I make this very um, riveting PowerPoint presentation as part of my employment, then the Arts Law Centre of Australia owns the copyright in the, um, in the work. Um, so that's a really important exception. Crown copyright. So if you, if this applies to state and Commonwealth governments, if, if um, the Crown, uh, if you make something as part of your employment with the Crown, or if the Crown, um, if the Crown uh, commissions some work, then they would get the, the copyright in, in, the, um, in the work. So, and even if they're the first to publish the work. So one of the things we're sort of very conscious of is if we make submissions to government, and if they're the one, first ones who publish those submissions, then they would get the copyright. It doesn't apply to local government. They're not considered, they don't get Crown copyright, because I know there's quite a lot of people here from local government organisations. And there are also some important exceptions that apply to Crown copyright, so that's, that's why it's, that's important. And there is a small, um, and contracts is the other way, um, a very important way of changing copyright ownership. So if you make something um, and there's a contract that says the copyright will be owned by you know, someone else and that's signed um, by the creator um, and you give your copyright to somebody else, then contracts is a way of managing transfer of ownership of copyright. There are some commissioned works um, that are done for private and domestic purposes, such as photography or portraits, where the commissioner will own the copyright, but that's a very limited exception. I'm going really fast because I've got a very small amount of time to give you um, a copyright course. 
Um, what rights do the copyright owners have? Um, this is really important because, again, in the digital context, um, one of the important rights that applies to all works is, um, is communication um, of the work to the public, and that involves putting it online or sending it, you know, in an, um, in an email. Or uh, so it's, it, that's really important. Um, uh, right. Also reproduction, so that includes digitising. So if you have a, a photograph and you're making a digital copy of that photograph, then that's um, reproduction. Um, publication, so if you're putting the, the new copy um, of the work into a publication, onto, um, into a book, then then you'd be using the publication um, right that belongs to the uh, owner, the copyright owner. Then for there's specific rights that apply to music, literary and dramatic work, so that's performance, adaptation and commercial rental arrangements. For films, to make a copy, cause it to be seen or heard in public and communicate it to the public. So for example, with a, a film, say you've got an old VHS copy of a film, say it's a, um, I'm just trying to think of an example, uh, say an old docu documentary and, uh, it's an, and say it's not available. Um, in any other format, so you digitise that um, and make it available on a um, DVD, and you allow it to be heard, seen in the um, the library. Maybe you have a room where you can show um, people can come and watch films. That would be be making um, causing it to be seen or heard in public. And then for sound recordings, there's make a copy, cause it to be um, heard in public, communicate it to the public and commercial rental arrangements. So they're all the rights that the copyright owner has and they apply to different rights, slightly different rights apply to slightly different subject matter. So how long does copyright last? If we look at the first, um, the group of works, literary works, um, literary works, musical works, artistic works and dramatic works. General pr principle is, the life of the artist plus 70 years. Um, for films and sound recordings, it's 70 years from publication. And when the work hasn't been published at all, unpublished work, it can be ongoing, so it's in perpetuity. So there's some real issues around unpublished works. Okay, there are exceptions. Um, so there are fair dealing exceptions. Some people sometimes get confused because we hear a lot about fair use um, and that's an American exception that exists. We don't have fair use in Australia. We have what's called fair dealing and they're fairly narrow exceptions um, that exist and there's, there's a review this year of looking at these fair dealing exceptions to see whether or not they're broad enough and they work well enough um, for Australian society as it stands today. So these include criticism and review, um, reporting the news, research and study, and parody and satire. Uh, and then there are some library and archives provisions which do allow um, some copying for preservation purposes. There are statutory licenses that allow educational institutions to um, copy work for students and for specific uses within the um, educational institutions. And then there are some uh, the flexible dealing provisions that were brought in in 2006, which assist um, libraries, archives, and um, some educational institutions, and um, for use um, by or for people with disabilities. So they are important exceptions for quite a lot of people um, and the collections that you're dealing with here today in terms of digitising collections. And there's some quite good guidelines. Um, that deal with um, digitising collections and how to use that um, flexible dealing section 2A. Um, I haven't got the, um, I've just got a copy here. Um, it's put out by um, the Australian Libraries Copyright Committee and the Australian Digital Alliance um, with the assistance of the National Library of Australia. And it's called the User's Guide and it's available online. And I can give the reference to um, museums and galleries so they can distribute that because that's really helpful working through some of these issues. 
Okay, so copyright infringement. I'm just telling you what this is. If you use, because this is important, if you use the whole or a substantial part of a copyright work without the copyright owner's permission, generally this isn't allowed under Australian copyright law. So substantial is to be a little bit tricky. It means um, the whole, um, sorry, it means a vital or important um, part of a work. It doesn't mean that the whole of the artwork or the, other, the work has to be um, copied. It's not a 10% rule. There are some 10% provisions, but that's not about what's a substantial um, amount, generally speaking. So it's vital or important. And sometimes a very small um, part of a work could be considered to be um, a substantial amount, even though in terms of percentage um, size, um, it might be you know, only a couple of percent of the whole work. So um, I'm just thinking of a, a visual arts example. For example, uh, it's not in copyright anymore, um, the Mona Lisa. And you think of her smile or her lips or you think of her eyes. Now, even though these are quite small parts of the whole work, under copyright law, they may well be considered to be um, a substantial amount because they're a vital or important part of that work. So what do you need to do if you don't actually hold the copyright in the work? Um, you need to get a licence um, from the artist or the creator or the copyright owner of the work. Arts Law has been developing a sample licence with the Centre for Media and Communications Law um, in, at Melbourne University, specifically for use by collecting institutions to try and simplify this process. So, um, or you could get a licence if there's one available through a collecting society. Um, I, I was going to touch on moral rights. So they're really important rights, um, just to be aware of three rights, the right of attribution um, of the creator. And this is even if the, um, you don't own, if the creator doesn't own the copyright, they still will have uh, moral rights, the right to be attributed, the right against false attribution, so not to have someone else's name put against their work, and the right of integrity. And that's the right not to have the work damaged or altered or interfered in some way, which would cause harm to the um, reputation of the creator. Um, so that's it. Um, this isn't legal advice. And, um, <laughs> and these are all the organisations, uh, some of the government funders that support arts law.